Well, good morning, friends. How are you? If we have not met, Charlie Salamone, lead pastor here. So we've been doing a series on the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. Let's do a quick little recap of what we've seen thus far. So if you're new to all of this, you probably know that the book of Genesis it has things like Adam and Eve, the creation of the world, Cain and Abel, um, Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babel. But for those who have been with us here, you know that that is not really what the book of Genesis is primarily focused on. That is kind of just the introduction. The primary focus of the book of Genesis is this fellow named Abraham and his kids, his grandkids and such, his family. And throughout the rest of the Bible, there are a bunch of times where God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's something he wants to be known as. So you got to ask this question, what's so special about Abraham, his son Isaac, and his grandson Jacob? What's so special about these people where God is going to take his name based on these people? What's so special about them? And the answer is they had a special relationship with God. This needs to be seen and understood. Abraham, Isaac, and today our focus will be Jacob, had a special relationship with God. And by special, I mean it's not what you'd expect when you think naturally about who God is and who people are. The way that God interacts with these people isn't normal. It isn't what you would expect. It's, it's special. Let's do, uh, remember what happened in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, just an ordinary guy, like you and I, he encounters God, and he gets a special promise given to him. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you, and whoever dishonors you, I'm going to curse. So right there, that's pretty weird. I'm going to treat other people based on how they respond to you. That's weird, isn't it, if you think about it? And that's what happens, actually. Abraham, he goes on his way. For a while, he's doing well, trusting God, and then he sins. And he finds himself in Egypt, and he's afraid, and he lies. He lies about his wife. Um, you can go back and read it if, if, if you want. But he lies about his wife. And the king of Egypt, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but basically, God curses the king of Egypt, and he didn't even really do anything wrong. It's really just he, the way that this guy is responding to Abraham. It was really kind of Abraham's fault. And the whole thing is really odd when you think about it. And the only conclusion that you can make is Abraham is getting special treatment here. Right? If, if you don't know the story, just trust me. What you have in Genesis chapter 12 is Abraham is getting very special treatment. And to be honest, in ways it seems a little unfair. Abraham sins in Egypt, and he leaves town a rich man. And that's how Genesis chapter 12 works out. Uh, sometime later, Abraham has a kid. Cheryl talked about him last week. Isaac, remember that guy? Isaac did the same thing as his father. He lied about his wife. And you know how the chapter ends? He's planting, and he's reaping a hundredfold. Okay? Okay? It's the same thing. It's a guy with a special relationship with God, where God doesn't deal with them in the normal means. People are getting blessed here. Abraham is getting blessed. Isaac's getting blessed. Isaac sins, and the chapter ends with him, a super, super rich guy. It all is very odd. It's a very special relationship. And to be honest, if you're reading it, and maybe you're hearing it right now, and maybe this is new information for you, it can make you a little uncomfortable. It can make you a little uncomfortable because it seems kind of unfair. And in fact, I'll say it this way. If you're not feeling that to a certain degree, maybe you're not actually hearing what's going on here. The way that God deals with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob should strike you as odd and maybe even a little unfair. I mean, these fellows are getting special treatment. There's no denying that. They have a special relationship, and they're getting special treatment. Well, we saw it with Abraham. We saw it with Isaac. But my, oh, my, are we going to see it today? Because Abraham and Isaac were well-behaved church kids. 
in comparison to Abraham's grandfather, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, as you might know, the name means deceiver, and deceiver he was. Uh, he's, a, he's a manipulative little scoundrel, no doubt. But he has this special relationship, and it's something that we should consider. Okay, um, Father God, help me. Let your word speak to us. Let our hearts be tender and attentive, Lord. Remove distractions. Help us understand that your word is worth listening to, God. And speak to us. Speak to all of us. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're diving right in to... Uh, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man, and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau when Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back. Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I might give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two joy, choice young goats so that I might prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. Okay, let me just recap what's going down here. So Isaac has this special blessing. Remember, it started with Abraham, and then it got handed down to Isaac, this special blessing from God. And Isaac, he's getting old, he's blind, and he kind of feels like, I'm going to die soon. It's time for me to hand this special blessing down to my son. Now, what you see here is a family that is, <laughs> I'm looking for the word, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> the word that comes to my mind is inappropriate. Um, you have a family that is messed up, okay? You have a, uh, what is our series called? <laughs> Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional is not strong enough of a word. That's the problem. That's, that's my problem. Is this is a dysfunctional family, but I need a stronger word than dysfunctional. This family's messed, okay? Um, the name that, that we were going to give, we, the name we have given this series is the beloved dysfunctional family of God, Genesis. Because they are, they are loved by God, but oh, they've got problems, and we're seeing it now. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, we got some major favoritism going on within the family. We read that earlier, and we're seeing it play out now. Isaac's favorite son is Esau, and Rebecca's favorite son is Jacob. They're twins, and there's favoritism going on. Um, there is a huge lack of trust in lots of ways. Uh, Rebecca is spying on Isaac. Isaac is trying to do this blessing ceremony, it seems like he's kind of trying to do it in secret, and there's reason for that. Uh, let's talk about Isaac a little bit, and just what's happening here. Isaac does not trust God in the, this particular day anyways. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't want God's will. Let me explain. Earlier, there was a prophecy given. God said, regarding these two children, 
um, the older will serve the younger. God has basically said earlier that the special blessing is going to go to Jacob. Isaac prefers Esau, and Isaac is thinking, perhaps in secret, he's going to thwart the will of God, <laughs> and he's going to pretty much just take matters into his own hands. And as a side note, perhaps I'll get into this later, that's really what sin is. Sin is when we take matters into our own hands rather than walk in trust with God. So on this particular day, Isaac thinks that he has a better plan than God. I think the blessing should go to Esau. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my special blessing to Esau. That's Isaac's plan. Uh, Esau, we talked about him two weeks ago. Esau is uh, the firstborn of Rebekah and Jacob. And in the New Testament, Esau is kind of an example of someone who is godless. He's used as an example of someone who is lost, who is godless, and basically, earlier in the story, Esau traded his birthright for a bowl of red soup because he thought that that was just more important to him. Esau is someone who is short-sighted, meaning he sees the things in front of him that he wants, and he doesn't think about the big picture of who God is and where life is ultimately found. So Esau is seen, and we're going to see this more today, Esau is seen as someone who is godless, and he's kind of an example. Kind of a, what did I call it two weeks ago? He is a cautionary tale, okay? Esau is someone you don't want to be like, and, and we're going to see how his story lays out today. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, uh, Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca wants the blessing to go to Isaac. She's spying on her husband, the Again, the whole family's got lots of, lots of issues going on. There's a huge lack of trust between each other and even more so not trusting God. Rebecca, what's her deal? She agrees with God. She wants the blessing to go to Jacob. That's what God said was going to happen. She wants that to happen. But here's where her lack of trust comes in. She thinks, I need to take matters into my own hands to secure the promise. God already said he was going to do it. You don't need to step in with your sinful means and make it happen. Uh, you know, there's a phrase that people say sometimes. God helps those who help themselves. You ever hear that? It's not in the Bible. And the Bible actually says something pretty opposite to that. Uh, you, you ever hear that, though? People say that God helps those who help themselves, which is basically like, you go and you live and you fight and you take what you need and that's how you will secure your blessing. When the Bible says something very different on a heart level, hear this. So this is something I quote a lot. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Do you hear that? Who does God work for? Those who wait on him. Those who say, I hear your promise. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to wait on you. Waiting on God does not mean laziness, by the way. It doesn't mean we just sit home all day and watch TV. But what it means, on a heart level, we submit to his spirit. We let him Lead us. Lord, not my will, but your will. I trust you. I trust you to do it. I don't need to step in and take matters into my own hands. Instead, I will submit to your spirit. And if your spirit says stay, I will stay. And if your spirit says go, I will go. But you be God, and I'll just be me. You do what God does, and I simply am your humble servant. You can see that Rebecca's not doing that today, is she? She wants what God wants. She wants Jacob to get the blessing. But she doesn't trust that God's able to do it. So she thinks she needs to plan this great deception to make it happen. And Jacob, Jacob, his name means deceiver. <coughs> and Jacob is really, uh, you know, I could say like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He comes from a, a line of deceivers, really. I mean, his grandfather, you know, his father, his mom. He's going to take it to a new level, you know, with his life. But 
The big thing that's going on here with Jacob and the family is they have this great promise. The promise given to Abraham, the promise given to Isaac, and now the promise is going to go to Jacob. And the promise is, I will bless you. I will be with you. I will take care of you. And by the way, this is the blessing we have in Jesus. If you believe in him, this blessing is yours. But we have this great blessing. God's saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to show my love to you. But the problem with this dysfunctional family is they just don't trust him. They don't just rest in this great promise. They feel like they need to take matters into their own hands. And there's so much pain that is caused by these steps, these things they do. Stop for a second. Quick question. Do you guys know what sin is? Because a lot of times I get questions that kind of reveal the fact that people don't really know what sin is. A lot of times people will say, is this a sin or is that a sin? Is this a sin or is that a sin? And I realize I can't even answer your question because you want a list of do's and don'ts and you don't really even understand what you're talking about. What is sin? Sin can't be limited to just a list of do's and don'ts. You have to understand the heart of it. What is sin? Sin is whatever flows out of a heart that is not trusting God. Romans chapter 14, anything not done in faith is sin. Meaning sin is when we take matters into our own hands. Meaning I can't trust God, I can't trust his goodness, I can't trust he's going to take care of me, I can't trust that he has my best needs and, and my best interests at heart. I can't trust in his goodness. I can't trust in his plan. I need to do it my way. My way is better. I need to do it according to my own plan to be happy because if I don't, I'm not really going to be happy. You understand? Sin flows out of not trusting God. So if you're going to wonder what is a sin, you have to understand the heart level. And then you can have conversations of how does that manifest itself. But what you can see with this special loved family is they are a bunch of sinners. There's no doubt. So if you're a sinner, welcome to the family. You will fit right in. You'll fit right in with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? And to be honest, that's, that's one of the lessons here. This special, beloved family of God, they had major issues. They had major family dysfunction. Happy Father's Day, again, by the way. Um... <laughs> I, it, it struck me that on Mother's Day, I preached the sermon where Sarah died, and now on Father's Day, Father Isaac is, is going to get tricked. It's reality. Um, okay, so anyways, that's, the plan is impersonate Esau. Esau is hairy, put on some hairy, hairy, uh, uh, put on a hairy goat skin and, um, and go in there. Uh, this is a side note, but years later, Jacob is going to get deceived by one of his kids with a goat skin, and maybe remember that from the Joseph story. If not, don't worry about it now, but it's just a little, sometimes I add these little things that Bible nerds might find interesting, and the rest of you are like, whatever. Um, okay, so that's the plan. The plan is go in there and, and, and uh, deceive. So um, Isaac, verse 18, he went to his father and said, my father... Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, the Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So, so Isaac is pretty suspicious. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son Bring me some of your game to eat so that I might give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate. And he brought some wine, and he drank. It's good to have him drinking a little, apparently. Um, then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, 
The smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Okay, so he tricked him. He tricked him. He, Jacob, you have to be struck by his boldness. He invoked the name of the Lord in his deceit. Okay. How did you find that animal so quickly? The Lord blessed me. Um, and he says, come in and give me a kiss. And, and this like, kind of like de- deception and, and betrayal with a kiss, I mean, that kind of makes you think of, of Judas. I mean, that's what Judas did, if you know the story. Jacob is seen here as, as, a, as a snake. He's, it's one thing to lie to someone in like, like an email. I mean, that's not good, obviously. But this is like up close and personal. Up close and personal deception with his old blind father. Oh, man. And, and, and he pulls it off. Isaac puts the blessing upon him. Uh, verse 30. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, <clears throat> his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you received any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you. And have made all his relatives his servants. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept out loud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you, are, when you grow restless, you will throw his, woke, his yoke from off your neck. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Okay, let's talk about this guy Esau for a moment. Something um, that you are struck by is it's kind of sad. It feels sad. I mean, it's... Um, Esau is, is, it says he, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. Do you have only one blessing? Um, he's, he's, he's sad. You feel bad for him. There's definitely sorrow going on here. But when you read the whole Bible, you have to remember that Esau is a picture. Esau is a picture. Esau is an example of, of one who is ungodly. Um. Okay, how do I, I am reminded. The scriptures speak about worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. I'll fill you in if maybe you never heard these terms. Worldly sorrow. It says the scriptures say 1 Corinthians 7, I believe, or 2 Corinthians 7. It says worldly sorrow leads to death. But godly sorrow leads to repentance and life. And let me break that down. Worldly sorrow is what's going on here with Esau. It's great pain and, and regret. It's, it's loss. It's experiencing pain. Um, but it's limited as worldly sorrow. To help you understand, compare that with, with godly sorrow, which leads to repentance in life. Godly sorrow is the kind that feels the same thing in the sense of loss, 
But it goes deeper. It goes deeper to the place where one can say, who am I and who is God? Godly sorrow is the kind that can examine one's own life and say, what have I done? Who am I? Um, Notice what's lacking in Esau's pain. Any sort of acknowledgement of the fact that he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Any sort of confession is lacking. Any sort of acknowledgement. What's there instead? What do you have instead of any sort of like recognition that, hey, I'm a sinner? He's very sad, but with that is not any sort of humility, but instead anger, fury. He says, Jacob, I'm going to kill him. Once my father's dead, I'm going to kill Jacob. That's what he says. That's how he comforts himself. So you have a lot of pain and a lot of anger. And as I was thinking about this and knowing that he is the example in the New Testament of the ungodly, I was just reminded when I thought about this, the the, the bitter cry of Esau and the rage, a phrase that, that Jesus used kind of a lot, actually. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 22, 24, again in chapter 25. This phrase that Jesus uses, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what's going on on this day, isn't it? Gnashing of teeth, it's like grinding of teeth and rage and anger. He's crying, yeah. And there's fury, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to read it, and just brace yourself. This is one of those passages that just, you just got to hear. Uh, Jesus, Jesus said this, The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is kind of piercing, isn't it? Sometimes, often, to be honest, I do feel a responsibility to share with you these truths. That as much as God stands with arms open wide, ready to receive sinners like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you and me, ready to be our Savior, God also tells us, Jesus in love tells us, there is a day appointed for judgment. When those who have refused to come to me will suffer as sinners and lawbreakers. And by the way, let me remind you, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, these guys are sinners and lawbreakers too, aren't they? Yes, but they have a special relationship with God. And that's what we're invited into, where our sins don't count against us. More on that a little later. So Esau stands as an example. By the way, I thought I should say this. He stands as an example of the ungodly, But I'm not sure if he himself is as lost as the example is, if that makes sense. I personally have a little hope for Esau. I think Esau is loved by God, and I think his story ends well. But we're going to leave that alone. But either way, he's an example for us. His story thus far is a little bit of a warning. It's supposed to be. Um, Okay. Um, Oh, here's a natural question that everyone asks. Why didn't, e, why didn't Isaac just revoke the blessing and say, okay, wait a second. <laughs> Let's take that back. Jacob tricked me, canceled it. You know, I don't know. Like that, that blessing is annulled. We're going to do a new one. Why didn't Isaac just do it over? I think what happened is, because when Isaac found out he was deceived, it says he trembled violently. I think what happened, to be honest, is Isaac, Isaac realized something spiritual just happened And he kind of realized that he's been trying to thwart the will of God. I mean, he knew that the prophecy was that Jacob would be um, the, 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 the supreme holder of the blessing. And that's what I think is going on here is Isaac just realized I'm trying to outwill God and it just doesn't work that way. And you kind of see as you keep reading that Isaac does have a change. He, Isaac really does kind of submit to God in this sense. And, um, Also, it's like I'm reminded of 
Romans chapter 11, it says, the calling, the calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable. And there's something to be said here of like, it doesn't change. It doesn't stop. Um, so anyways, uh, let's keep going. Verse 42, when Rebecca was told that her older son Esau had said, uh, when, when, when Rebecca was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of the land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So there's more of the manipulation going on. Um, Rebecca doesn't want Isaac to get killed by Jacob. She wants Isaac, or she, she, she doesn't want Jacob to get killed by Esau. She wants Jacob to leave. Instead of telling that to her husband, she just says she needs Jacob to go find a wife because she doesn't want him to marry someone like the Hittite women that Esau married that's making her life miserable. And so it's, it's a half-truth, but it's, it's kind of a lie. Um, so anyways, uh, chapter 28, verse 1. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padam Aram, to the house of your mother's father Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way and he went to Padamaran to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Uh, so here it seems, like I said, that Isaac has come to terms, like, you are the child who shall receive the blessing. And he seems happy about that, in this case at least. Um, and he blesses him. And he blesses him, and he says, go. And so Jacob is taken off, fleeing for his life. There's a little note here about Esau that I'll read. Um, when you get to verse 6, it says, Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Padam Aram to take a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padam Aram. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac, because uh, Esau had married a, a few of them at this point. Um, so he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of Nebioth, and daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. Okay, this opens up a whole other ball of wax we don't have time for. Um, uh, the whole question of um, polygamy. You can't really escape it, can you? Read the book of Genesis. It's like, what's going on here? Read the rest of the Old Testament. What's going on here? This is all over the place. Um, it's not good. And you can kind of see in the subtleties where it's like Esau is marrying these women in addition to the wives he already had. It's kind of like subtly saying like more of this. And to be honest, I think we're going to touch on this more um, maybe a little bit next week, but a little farther down as we consider um, the multiple wives of Jacob. I think we'll talk about this a little more in detail. But now just say it's not good. You can see it in the subtleties of the scripture that it's not good. But God in his grace, he is coming in to dysfunctional families and changing them from the inside out. Um, also, what Esau is trying to do here, he see, without getting into it, what Esau is trying to do is he's trying to just add some good behavior to try to make up for his bad behavior. That's really what's going on. Um, and that is, in a lot of ways, the essence of false and empty religion where someone's like, hey, I'm going to do some religious things. I'm going to go to church. I'll do some rituals. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help some old ladies cross the street. And that'll make up for the fact that I don't live for God in my heart at all. <laughs> you know, that's, that is dead religion. That's a summary of dead religion, where your heart is not actually rendered to God. There's no real relationship. There's no real place where you're like, God, I'm a sinner. I need help. Lead me. Change my heart. I want to live for you. Like the things that honest and real religion says 
Empty religion is when you don't actually give your heart to God, but you are like, hey, I'll, I'll, go, to, I'll go to church on Christmas and Easter. Or it's like, or, or some people are really devoted. I'll go to church every single Sunday. Okay, that's fine. But that counts for nothing if you don't give your heart for, to God. And that's really just what, what it means to have this special relationship. It means that you, you walk with him. You believe in him. And, and that's the invitation for all of us. Okay, so anyways... Jacob is running for his life. His brother's going to kill him. He's got to flee right away. Uh, you get to verse 10 of chapter 28, and it says, Jacob left Beersheba and set off for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to the land." I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He's thinking, he's, he's running for his life as a fugitive. He just did something awful. God appears to him, and our natural minds would think, oh, God is going to deal with him. God is going to stop this sinner in his tracks. But that's not what happens. Instead, God shows up just to bless him. Just to say, hey, I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. I am with you, and I'll never leave you. That's what he shows up to say. And you're supposed to be feeling a little bit of this like, what? So you're just going to let him get away with that? You're just going to show up and bless him? More on that in a little bit, but here, uh, notice this promise that's given you. I will never leave you. It's, a, it's often quoted, people, um, it's often quoted in different ways, this idea. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you. And actually, I'm going to read this passage in the New Testament that, that quotes this, this idea. Um, well, let me just read it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So there's some... There's some um, there's some advice, if you want to call it that. There's, um, like, uh, the, the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Let's talk about that for a moment. Sexually immoral, it, it, the word is often translated fornicator. What this is basically saying is sex that's not within marriage. Sex outside of marriage. That's, that's what it's saying. Um, fornication and, um, and adultery. That's sex outside of marriage. And I, I know... I know that we're living in a culture where that just sounds like craziness. Like, so sex is only going to happen within marriage and anything outside of marriage is not good. I understand we're in a world that thinks that is just super weird and like Amish, okay? Let's just acknowledge that. That's the world we're living in. Yet nevertheless, God seems to say that he only wants sex to happen within marriage. What's going on? What's so special about this piece of paper, as people might say? And what does it have to do with this whole conversation with Jacob and Isaac and Esau? Why are you talking about this now? Just stay with me, okay? Who is God, and how does he deal with us? How does he deal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What's the big thing that he wants them to hear. I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to take care of you. If you sin, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to chase you down, and I'm going to show you my love. 
Because you're mine and I am yours. We have this special relationship and it's never going to end. That's who God is with his people. And that is what marriage is supposed to communicate. Covenant love. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We are in this together. That is what marriage is. And marriage is supposed to point to God. It's supposed to point to that special relationship. Sex outside of marriage is tarnishing the image of God because that's not who he is. Someone is going to say, yeah, yeah, but we love each other. Love that is not willing to promise is love that is limited. Do you understand that? Love that is not willing to say, till death do us part, for better or for worse, I will never leave you. It's not the kind of love that God has for his people, and it's not the kind of love that a man and a woman, a husband and a wife is supposed to show. The reason why God doesn't like it is because it lies about who he is. It, it tarnishes what love really is. We're living in a world that doesn't understand what love is. Do you understand that? This kind of love, this kind of love that says, I will never leave you. We're living in a world that is so void of that. This, this thing that says, I should probably mention it. I know I'm over my time. I'm almost done. Almost done. Uh-huh. It's, it says God will judge. God will judge them. And that's just, what does that mean? Does that mean like sent to hell, damn them? Or does that just mean like fatherly discipline? And the answer is it's, 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 it's both in the sense of for all things. For those who are outside of his promises and they don't believe in him, for unbelievers, sin is dealt with with, with judgment. But for those who are part of the special relationship, it's not... It's not judgment and, and damnation that we should fear. It's fatherly discipline. Um, and then this thing of keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because I will never leave you and never forsake you. And this is the point. This, this is the point. There is a truth here. There is a truth. This message that God has for his people. I am never going to leave you. My love is not going to end. I'm going to take care of you. There's something about that truth that's supposed to set us free from the temptation of sexual morality or chasing after money or chasing after this or chasing after that. It's supposed to set us free from sin. It's supposed to bring contentment because God is good and God is faithful and God's going to take care of me and God's going to meet my needs and the longings of my heart he's going to satisfy so I don't need to take matters into my own hands. Let this truth sink in. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their great problem was they had this blessing, but they didn't know how to rest in it. And really, that's, that's our desire is to learn how to rest in this promise. Um, okay, I have to wrap up, and I just want to read one more passage because it really summarizes what we're doing here. This is New Testament. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? This is the most important thing to understand in the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You've got these special people, and their sins don't count against them. God just blesses them. They sin. How does God respond? He blesses them. You have to see that. There is a special relationship. Blessed is the one the Lord will never count their sin against them. That can be you. That can be me. That is the great promise of Jesus for those who would believe in him. Um, do you know... The vision that Jacob saw, do you remember? He saw a, a ladder or a stairway, depending on the translation, and angels and descending. For like 2,000 years, no one knew what that meant. No one knew what that meant. But then Jesus arrives, John chapter 1, and he says, you're going to see angels ascending and descending upon me. I am the ladder. I am the connection of heaven and earth. I am the blessing of Jacob. I am the blessing of Abraham and Isaac. And let me break it down for you. The special relationship where God just blesses us and says, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to take care of you. My love is never going to fail. Even when you fail me, when you sin, I'm going I'm to follow you. I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to bless you where you are. That is the love that I have for you. Do you know who that's for? For those who would believe. For those who would say, Jesus, I need a savior. You're my savior. I believe in you. Take me. 
For sinners who are willing to believe, the special relationship is yours. One more thing, and then, and then I'm done. And this is really about next week. One more thing. Some of you are thinking still, I am just upset here. So God is just going to let these certain people get away with it. God's just going to let, God's not going to deal with Jacob. Jacob is such a sinner and God's not going to deal with him. Oh, he's going to deal with them. <laughs> and you're going to see some of that next week. He's going to deal with them. He's going to deal with them. And it's kind of entertaining, to be honest. You're going to want to be here next week. It's, it's, God has a very interesting way of dealing with Jacob. But, but the point is, he's going to deal with them. And this is the point. And this is what he's doing in your lives too, by the way. I'm going to teach this, this deceiver how to trust me. Because right now he has this promise, but he doesn't rest in it. He takes matters into his own hands, and he lives really based on his own scheming and manipulation. I'm going to teach him how to trust me. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to teach him how to trust me. And I want you to know, beloved, that's what he's doing in your life right now. And that's why your Christian life is hard. He's teaching you how to trust him. And it's going to be worth it. Okay? All right, surely you can come up. Father, help us. <laughs> Forgive me for going way over my time limit because I know you guys have questions. It's Father's Day, so I'm a father. Forgive me. We're just gonna do. We're just gonna do two questions. We're just gonna do two questions today. So if you're in the room and you have a question, just feel free to raise your hand, and we have someone coming around with the mic, or you can text the number on the screen with your question, and I will read that off my phone. And so are there any questions in the room right, right off? Yes, we have one over here. What practical steps you can take to rest in that assurance, how to get the patients to, like we know we are saved and he will meet all our needs, but sometimes you have the doubts and years pass and months and so on. Thank you for that because this was one of the things that I wanted to say, but I just forgot and ran out of time. Cheryl, how many promises did you say last week are in the Bible? Over 3,000. There's like 3,000 promises. Um, one of the best things you can do is just read the Bible, and when you notice these promises, meditate on them. That's the, what the Bible says, but really what that means is think about it. Think about it. Tell yourself. Preach to yourself. God is faithful. He says this. Talk to God about it. That's what I do sometimes. I'm like, God, you, says this. you said this. I don't feel this right now, but you said it, so do it. <laughs> you know, um, Take these promises and hold them. Tell yourself these promises, pray these promises, and talk about these promises with other people. That really has a way of strengthening the faith in your heart also. So the simple answer is, hold on to the promises. Focus on the promises. Um, and, and that means you read your Bible, because there's thousands of them that you might be missing out on, you know, experiencing the joy of. Yeah, I highlight them in a specific color in my Bible so I can see them. When highlight I'm the through. promises, that's good. Color code, yeah. Okay, any other questions in the room? Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh. This will be the last question, so the band, you can come up. Um, I just wanted to know how you know that God has forgiven you for your sin after repenting for them. Wow. Um, that's a great question. Um, the scriptures say... If we, he is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, um, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, that word, like, confessing, it doesn't mean, like, each time you sin, you become dirty and then you need to be cleansed again. Um, but it means for those who are living a life of confessing. Um, for those who are living a life that says, Lord, I want to live for you. Uh, how do we know that we've been forgiven? Um, I think uh, it's, see, there, there's different things. There's to know it and to know it, okay? On the one level, to know it, I mean, it's like we can look at his word. 
Um, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Um, if, you, if you look to his promise, Jesus is Lord, he died for my sins, if you believe it, if you can nod your head and say, yeah, that, that's me, well then you have forgiveness. I mean, this is like gospel 101. If you believe in Jesus, forgiveness is yours. It's the thing that we tell people when they don't know anything about the Bible. They say, Jesus died for your sins. So that's to know it. But I, I think what you're probably talking about is a deeper kind of knowing. The kind of knowing where you feel the joy and the love and the assurance. Um, and I would say for that, um, it's similar to the answer I gave over here. Where it's like you take these promises, you take these scriptures, and you hold to them. And you, and you say, Lord, this is mine. Help. You, you, you wrestle, so to speak. We're going to see Jacob wrestling with God next week. You wrestle. You say, Lord, let this truth be alive in my heart. You have said this, but I don't feel it. Um, so sometimes it means taking God's promises and, and meditating on them, thinking about them, holding to them. Um, so, yeah. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Yeah, preach the gospel to yourself. By the way, I just want to say I, I know that walk of um, having the Bible, um, believing the truth in the sense where I tell it to other people, um, but I'm very aware of my own sin and I, and I don't feel forgiven. I feel rather dirty. You know, I've lived that life. Um, I, I, I know that feeling. Uh, remember that the, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. Um, meaning he accuses God's children. And so you can hear that voice, even though God has very much forgiven you, you can still hear this voice that says that you're awful. Um, yeah.